Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out, and, and uh, glad you made it here in time to uh, get to the start. So yeah, so I'm going to talk today about uh, design that's easy on the brain. Uh, as Jen mentioned, currently I lead technology experience strategy for a really interesting team at Bank of Montreal, which is looking at redesigning how we deliver IT solutions inward to the uh, employees. So not a typical kind of customer experience team, it's actually an employee technology experience team. Um, but what led me here is that uh, I've got a varied background in entrepreneurship. I've done uh, consulting, technology startups, uh, and kind of, you know, if I had to pick kind of three areas that I specialize in typically, it's experience design, technology, and visual thinking. Uh, and it's really that visual thinking arm that's kind of led me into kind of doing some investigation and learning about how it, how it is we truly see and how our brain processes uh, what we're looking at. So I'd be horribly remiss if I didn't uh, bring up this, right? Okay, so show of hands, who sees white and gold? Right? And who sees blue and black? It's a good mix. And this is a really good example. And, and, uh, and who would have thought one of the most controversial images that was going to come out this year, right, would be a, a badly exposed picture of a dress? Um, and I was actually, you know, kind of thrilled as I saw this unfolding because it's a really good example of what I'm going to talk to you about today. And that really is that our brain, you know, I know the dress is blue and black. No matter how much I look at it, I usually see a yellow and white or a, a yellow and blue, at least a yellow and blue. I have found if you kind of like cover most of it and look through like a hole in your finger, it tends to go blue and black. But it shows you that what really happens is we see what our brain sees, or what our brain shows us, sorry. Right, so our brain is actually, it's not like the eyes are a direct, uh, a direct tunnel to what you see, right? Your brain is actually making decisions and interpreting what it's looking at and showing you its best guess at, hey, this is what the world looks like. And our brains are fantastically complicated, right? It's got billions of neurons. Um, the average neuron in your brain connects to another 10,000 neurons. Um, if you want to put it to scale, in 2012, Cisco estimated that there's between 8 and 10 billion devices connected to the internet, which would put our brains at about 10 times the size of Cisco's. If you think of the number, total number of connections going on in our brain, it's like 10 internets, circa 2012. And so what makes that really even uh, more interesting is that there are more connections in one cubic centimeter of brain matter than there are stars in the Milky Way. Right? There's a lot going on in our brains. And when you think of that scale and the processing power, it's even more amazing to think that one-third of that processing power is dedicated towards our vision. Right? That one-third of our brain is constantly taking in what is it seeing, what's going on in the world around us, and actually putting that to use and trying to help us interpret it. So when I talk about design that's easy on the brain, uh, there's a quote I like to use from a, a, a researcher named Colin Ware. Um, who actually, his materials kind of set me off on looking into this. He talks about the goal of information design must be to design displays so that visual queries are processed both rapidly and correctly for every important, important cognitive task the display is intended to support. Right, if we take a few words out to simplify that, right, design so visual queries are processed rapidly and correctly for every important cognitive task. Or as I like to say, design for visual efficiency. Right, so this is about designing so that our brains have to put the least amount of effort into understanding what they're seeing in order to process it, right? If, you're, if you've got hugely complicated uh, designs, you're going to run into a lot of problems like where people have to really think about it and digest it, whereas if you do the right kind of design, brains are going to get the gist of it right away and will be more efficiently routed to the things they need to understand. So let's talk about how we see. And to understand how we see, it's first important to understand what we don't see. What a lot of people don't realize is the vast majority of the world is out of focus at any given time. Right? We're actually, very little of what we're actually, you know, if you take that split second where you're looking somewhere, the vast majority of it is out of focus. So let's try something. Make sure you don't clock the person in the front of you in the head when you do this, but take your arm, extend it out arm's length in front of you, and look at your thumbnail. Okay. That's the approximate size of what's in focus at any given time. So if you, look, if, you, if you look at your thumb, you'll see, you can actually see it quite clearly. And keeping your thumb there, try looking at something else and just kind of being aware of your thumb. You'll see how quickly your thumbnail goes out of focus, right? So our eyes are moving around all the time trying to make sense of the world and actually creating what feels like a completely in focus picture for you is actually your eyes, the same way a TV kind of scans, right? Your, your eyes are scanning all over and putting things constantly in focus and assembling a picture. 
It's the same way, I don't know if people have seen that you, you actually have a blind spot in your eye, right? There's a really, if you draw two dots on a piece of paper a few inches apart and close one eye and pull it close to you, you'll actually see there's a point where the second dot actually disappears, right? Uh, both our eyes have blind spots. Conveniently, they're in different spots. And your brain is actually kind of just glossing. It's like the clone tool in Photoshop, right? It's kind of glossing over that hole and just saying, oh, it's not there. Don't worry about that. Um, but what's really fascinating is that, that thumbnail, that thing is about 5% of your field of vision, right? Of everything you can see, it's about 5% of it. But it actually uses half our visual processing power, right? Your, your eye is, your brain is focusing so much energy on that one little circle. And that's partially because our, the way our receptors work in our eyes are actually different from, say, like pixels on a computer monitor, right? Pixels on a com computer monitor are very linear, right? They're, they're exactly the same size, they're all in a line, they're in a row. But in our brain, they're actually very, very tiny and dense right in the center of the eye, and they get kind of chunkier and chunkier as they get to the outside. And what that means is, at that kind of thumbnail distance, you can see about 100 points on the head of a pin when you look at it, when you're looking right at it. But out at the periphery, like your peripheral vision, you actually only really see big blobs, right? And so your brain's kind of put this whole field in, and you'll see uh, if someone you know kind of comes up in your peripheral vision, you'll probably recognize them. But otherwise, you're probably just going to see a shape or you're going to see just a blob. Even our colors aren't great. If you get home and you grab like four uh, like whiteboard markers right, with the different color tips and try and hold them out here, you probably will not be able to tell what color each marker is out the side of your vision. Right? That's how bad your peripheral vision gets. It's more just kind of like an early detection system of something's coming into my field of view. Uh, but it, you can't make out fine details. What's really interesting, though, is that even though most of the world is out of focus, our eyes are monitoring that whole space all the time. They're pulling in. The brain is kind of keeping tabs on it and really saying, is this something I need to pay attention to, right, so that you know to look at it. So it's not like you just have that pinpoint focus. Your brain is taking in all that information uh, all the time. But so how we process this is we see through visual queries, right? There are kind of search processes and queries that our brains do at lightning speed um, every moment we're awake, every moment we're looking around. And there's two kind of main processes. One is the what am I looking at, right? Like, so just standing here at my brain trying to take in what I'm looking at in front of me. And then the where, right? And the where is actually where I'm trying to focus and find something, right? So I'm looking at a series of people. Now if I'm trying to look for a specific person, my brain flips into that where kind of process. So the what, right, discovery, understand. What, where is the confirming, is this what I'm looking for? How do I find it? So I'm going to focus first on the what, the processing of the visuals. And what I want you to do is watch carefully. There's a couple images that are going to blink up quickly. And try and retain as much as you can about the image, and we'll see if you can answer a question, right? So here's the first one. So what color was the blue canopy? <laughs> you want to see? But what was the setting? Beach, right? Everyone saw it was a beach, but you didn't necessarily pick up, you didn't even see the blue canopy, right? But you knew it was a beach instantly. What about this one? What station was it? But what was it? Subway station, right? And last but not least, what kind of tree? Right? You knew there was trees. You knew it was a forest, right? You might even have an idea, hey, that's an Ontario forest versus a European forest. But the details aren't there, right? So we can look at each of these, and we can easily, very quickly, in a split second, you know exactly what you're looking at. Right? Even, and I just, PowerPoint will only let me show you it for a second. If I could get it down to half a second or a tenth of a second, I would have flashed it that fast. And you probably still would have picked up what I was looking at. And that's your brain is, can scan so fast and pick up the major patterns that it's picking on based on what you're used to seeing and make quick decisions. So what's happening here is your brain goes through this cycle, and this is the what cycle, right? So it's problem solving. It's like, okay, wh what am I looking at? What do I need to move my eyes around to understand the pattern? And how do I test that pattern? Right? I think it's a beach. Yeah, it looks like a beach. I think it's the sky. Yeah, it looks like a sky. And your brain's kind of just chunking together, kind of like a little Lego model, right? It's making this visual image for you. So we're capable of rapidly accessing complex, complex patterns. But we, to comprehend them, we have to process them deeper. And that's the second stage I'm going to talk about. This process is called gisting, right? For obvious reasons. You kind of get the gist of the scene, but you don't get the detail. You know what's happening. You know quickly, your brain knows if you're in danger or if you're probably safe, right? Things like that, like all those instinctual things that go on, your, uh, your brain is doing for you. 
So the second one, we talk about what? The second one is where. So now that we're standing in this station, right, now we have to go through this process of figuring out where are we? Like, what station am I in? Like, just pretend, you know, it's, you had a hell of a party last night, you've woken up, you're on a train station, you're like, where have I ended up? This is where you start this new query of going through and trying to test and understand what you're actually looking at. So you know, okay, I'm in a train station, and what's going to happen here is your brain's going to test the pattern again, and I look, so I'm looking for a sign, right? I want to understand what station am I in. So I'm going to look around and say, is that a sign? It's like that book, Are You My Mother, right? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Like, keep searching around, and your brain's going to test what you're looking at. Is that what I'm looking for? No? Okay, I'm going to move my eyes, right? Where else can I look? And your brain's constantly going between the what and the where to say, uh, what am I looking at? Is this what I, w I need to find? No, keep moving. And move my eyes, look around. And eventually, though, I can say, you know what? I can't see it from this angle. I'm going to move over here. Or I'm going to move my head, right? You're, so your brain's constantly trying to find its way to that vision um, that you need. And we do this planning and control. This happens like one to three times a second. Your brain is doing this, right? That's why people's eyes are flittering all over the place. It's because their brains are actually trying to pull in that whole picture and that whole image um, as often as possible. And so what we're doing when we're do looking is are we're using our neurons are looking for specific features. So your brain's conditioned for kind of four basic sets of uh, criteria or images that it wants to pull out. The big one's color, right? So color is a very important uh, way of helping us distinguish between things, right? Uh, the second one is orientation. So, you know, are the lines vertical? Are they horizontal? Are they on an angle? Um, that also helps with something called contouring, which I'll talk about in a minute. Shape, right? So we are trying to piece shapes together and understand how that kind of, how does it all fit together? What am I looking at? And last but not least is motion, right? And anyone can appreciate, you know, if you're, say, at a bar or a restaurant and you're uh, talking to someone and there's a TV in the background, how hard is it not to look at the TV, right? Even if you're not interested in it, the TV is still flashing and changing and always taking your attention, right? We're really sensitive to motion. Back when... You know, we used to depend on hunting, and we were being hunted by animals. It was really important to sense motion around you and be very aware of motion. So that's something that's obviously lasted and stays with us. And, uh, and what happens as we're going through this process is we kind of run through this cycle where our brain gathers all these features. It starts making patterns out of multiple features that it sees, right? So it starts kind of combining things. And eventually it turns them into these visual objects, right? So, oh, there's a person, there's a person, there's a person, there's a door, right? Like it's starting to combine these objects. Uh, but the challenge is uh, we actually have a very limited, um, oh, sorry, I want to talk about this first. So if you look at the scene again, now what your brain's going to start doing is looking around and saying, okay, I see rails, I see wall, okay, I found a wall, there's something that looks square, so it's a sign, oh, it's a billboard, it's too big, nope, there's the sign, right? And now you're brain's actually looking at the sign and now it goes into the new loop where it's reading the letters, right, and trying to figure out. So now you know you're in post Platz in Berlin, right? So that's what your brain is doing in split seconds, right? Probably once you saw the sign, it took you less than a second to kind of process what you were looking at, but that's what's happening is your brain is actually working to try and build these patterns. And it doesn't take a lot of detail to kind of get that gist, right? So what do, what do people think this is a picture of? What's that, sorry? Little boy, right? So you can't even see any detail, but it, instantly your brain knows, okay, I can piece this together, right? It's found some color, contrast, right? It sees a, a darker spot where a lighter space underneath. It sees lines and shapes that kind of divide the two. It's like, hey, that kind of looks like hair. Oh, there's two dots, right? Oh, there's a line. And it's kind of round. And your brain goes face. And of course there, and. The fact that you can even pick up that it's a little boy, not just that it's a face, but it's a little boy, just on those cues, right? It shows you how much kind of your brain is doing in the background for you. And it's why that dress is so interesting, because it's your brain's looking for cues, and your brain's trying to make judgment calls for you all the time. So the problem with that dress photo was that it was either overexposed or badly exposed, and whatever way your brain decided to take it was how it kind of affected how it interpreted the colors that it was seeing. And the, like, the best example I can think of this kind of contouring, um, and, uh, and the process it's actually called when it goes from features to pattern to object is called binding, right? Your, your brain starts binding objects together. And so uh, people, you know the movie uh, Terminator 2, right? 
So Schwarzenegger's just landed in the parking lot. He's naked. He's looking for clothes. And he goes into the biker bar, and it's the first time they kind of show from his perspective. And the whole time, his, brain, his uh, computer's kind of drawing lines around objects, right, and saying, oh, there's a biker here, a biker there, and finding and assessing everything. That's pretty much what your visual process is like. Your visual process is scanning the whole room and trying to assemble and, and assemble and disassemble and assemble and disassemble as it goes. So the same way that you saw um, Schwarzenegger's brain kind of contouring um, is what's happening here. But the challenge is we have a, a very limited visual working memory, right? So our brains can hold three or four objects at a time, uh, kind of pieced together. And they're constantly cycling through. So as we're looking around, we'll make a new memory, and it kicks the old object out. So this is constantly this constant cycling of objects. This happens in fractions of a second, right? Like some of these could last just a tenth of a second. Some of them last maybe last one or two seconds if you're really paying attention. And you might go back to the same object over and over again as you look around a room. Um, but so many people might even have trouble recalling details of the three pictures I quickly showed earlier, right? You may recall vaguely that there were beach in that, but if I tried to ask you to give me more detail, even though they're on the screen for a minute, they might be gone. There's a really good example um, of uh, an experiment they did where they'd have a stranger on a street, or they would go up to a stranger on the street and start asking for directions, right? So they'd walk up. And actually, the Just for Laughs gags did this as a prank on the show, but it actually was a, a proper scientific experiment that was done. And they'd go up and they'd say, hey, can you give me directions? And as the person's looking down to give them directions, two workers would come through holding a wall or like a big pane of glass, or not glass, but something that was opaque, right? You couldn't see through it. And they would rudely cut between the stranger and the person asking for directions. And when that happened, a new person would step in, and the original asker would kind of disappear. And then as the guys walked by, they would keep talking. And in the vast majority of cases, people wouldn't even notice. They wouldn't even register that that person had changed. Right? They even tested it with men and women. Like they would have a man start, and then a woman would come in. And the person still wouldn't pick up, because their visual memory, they're focused on the map now. Their object of that person, what their face looks like, because they're not a familiar person, it's, it, it was gone, right? They just had the map and they look up again. And sometimes it'd be kind of like, this doesn't feel right, but I couldn't tell you what changed. But if you're, say, your spouse, right, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or your wife was the one asking you directions and they swapped a person out, you know that you would know that they changed the person, right? So brains are very funny. Um, but it's also these patterns, right, and learning them. So uh, this is a great uh, example from Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics, where, you know, no matter whether it's a photograph or a crudely drawn circle with two dots and a smile, our brains still recognize the face, right? You may recognize who that person is on the left, but you don't need to know that it's a face to know, you don't need to know who it is to know that it's a face. This also backfires though, right? So the whole reason people see, you know, uh, faces in rocks or faces in pop cans or things like that is because it's triggering our pattern, right? Our brain's trying to make sense of something, and it's actually, it's, is that a face? No, it's not. Or, you know, you wake up at night and you think there's a person over by the chair, right? But when you actually focus on it, it's just your, you know, your hoodie is thrown over the corner, right? And it just happens to make that kind of body shape and your brain starts binding it. And that's where your, you know, your subconscious brain takes over and the fight or flight is like, holy crap, there's a person there. <laughs> and then you actually look and you're like, oh, okay, no, it's not. But you still have that feeling, you know, you can see where your brain's taken off on you because you, you still have that panicky feeling and the, your your brain's way ahead of you on the let's get out of here before you even realize that you're not looking at a person. This is also why um, uh, optical illusions that happen, right? Again, with the dress. Uh, this, yeah, I'm sure everyone's familiar with some variant of the vase and the faces. And it's our brains are desperately trying to piece together what we're seeing from time to time. And from time to time, it gets confused or it's missing key bits of information. So here, a big reason why this works the way it does is because of the shading as well. Because your brain's not sure, am I looking into something? Am I looking at the vase that's got a light coming from a certain direction? Am I looking at two faces with different lighting behind it? Your brain's going back and forth and trying to make that, right? What you might find interesting, if you look at it for a second and consciously try and see the faces, and then consciously try and see the vase, you won't be able to consciously see both, right? If you try and actually see both, you're going to probably find that you're, you can feel the perception of it changing a bit, almost like it's, I don't know, like shimmering or something, right? Like it goes back and forth. It's not, your brain can't hold both objects at the same time. It kind of, uh, it really confuses it. 
And then what happens as well is that over time, higher level patterns are combined. You start nesting kind of patterns within patterns within patterns. So, right, eyes have a pattern, right? You can look at an eye of just about any creature or animal or person, and eyes have a basic pattern, right? You can recognize an eye very quickly. But you can also recognize faces, right? So eyes are kind of part of the faces. So you've got, now you've got, you know, the pattern for a nose, the pattern for eyes, pattern for faces, all in, or uh, lips or mouth, all in kind of one combined pattern. And then even bigger still, now you know it's a tiger, right? And if you've never seen a tiger before, but you've seen cats, then you know that you've, you know, you're still going to have that pattern of, oh, well, that's a cat. I know what a cat is. Um, and what happens as well is over time, we develop these patterns that actually convey a lot of meaning, meaning right? Uh, they become proxies, essentially. So, you know, a stop sign, we look at that and we know what we have to do, right? The stop sign doesn't have to say, you need to stop your car on the line, look to see if anyone's coming. Uh, if it's clear, move forward, right? It's just, we see the stop sign and we know what's conveyed by all that process, right? So it becomes proxies to much deeper and bigger concepts. Uh, same with, you know, the washroom sign, uh, handicapped disability parking, where there's a phone, all those like icons, right? That's why icons are so powerful is because they become this very quick visual shortcut into what we're trying to do. Um, and what's really interesting now is that some of them, you know, think of the save icon, right? The save icon is still a diskette that hasn't been in a computer in probably going on like 15 years now, right? Or 10 years. You think of like kids who are just being born today and who are using computers and they have to they recognize what that save icon means, but they have no idea what the concept behind it is, right? And then the visual kind of legacy that got there. But the personal experience is a big deal, right? So people look at this, and like you said, it's a young kid, right? But for me, I know it's my son, I know it's Oliver, right? So I've got that personal thing that redefines the pattern for me that is very different, right? So you have to remember that your users, as they're working, they're going to have their own personal experiences they bring to it. This is why even... Uh, when you start thinking of like localization and internalization or globalization of software and technology, even colors mean very different things in different countries, right? Like what's white here um, can actually be very concerning or upsetting in another culture, or reds or yellows, right? Um, so you have to keep in mind that uh, the person's experience that's led them to your interface or device um, will actually impact how you, they perceive your designs as well. So you really have to know the audience that you're designing for. And, you know, as you know, a kid's a good example, or family, like recognizing family's a good example. But if you also think, if you haven't driven much in Europe, you probably have no idea what this sign is for, right? You wouldn't even know what to do with it. But if you're driving around Toronto, you already know what a no-stopping sign is, right? So in Europe, that's a no-stopping sign. But if here, it's a very different one. So it's, it's very important why you can't always rely on the icons. Um, you also have to very much consider who, what the user's brain is used to seeing and, and what their context is. So really, when it gets down to it, visual efficiency is about reducing visual searches, right? It's how do I make a design that lets people's brains zero in on what they're looking for as fast as possible so they're not hunting and they're not searching? And it really is the difference between cognitive effort and at a glance. And there's a great example of this. So cognitive effort, right? <laughs> so trying to find Waldo. And as I start to talk about visually like going through and processing stuff, you'll understand why Waldo can be so hard to find. I know people's popping up right now for a lot of people. But, um, but there's a, they're basically breaking every rule I'm going to talk to you about in the next few minutes to design these images, right? Whereas at a glance, Right. It takes all the fun out of Where's Waldo, but you can see how quick, by you know, separating them, isolating them, and using the rules I'm going to talk about, uh, make a big difference in being able to find or perceive them. So you know, the question probably now is like, great, now what? So the key really is to make your designs pop. And there's a concept that Colin Ware talks about in his book, Visual Thinking for Design, um, that's around that there are channels that let things pop. We talked about the neurons, how they're tuned for specific uh, features, and they really translate pretty linearly into these pop channels that you can use uh, to let people detect things. There's four. So the four of them are color, proximity, shape, and motion. So the first one we'll talk about is color. See, it pops. 
So color, obviously, the, the difference in color is uh, a big one, right? By using, you know, if you've got everything the same color and one's a different color, someone can zero in on that very quickly, right? That's why, like, emergency stop buttons are big red buttons in the middle of a gray plain thing. They're easy to find. They're very quick to see. Uh, the other one is lightness, right? So black and white. And this is an important consideration when you're doing, especially designs, you know, people, are, folks who are colorblind, right? You want to make sure that even if you take, like, the reds and greens out, that that lightness is still going to be different. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen a design where, you know, they use two buttons that are different colors, but if you take someone who's red, green, colorblind, those are actually going to look almost identical, right? You've lo completely lost that. And the other importance is that it's got to be different enough, right? So the same dots that were different in the last slide are different in this one. But I'm sure you guys can barely see a difference, right? You might pick up there's a slight bluish hue to the, the one on the left, and that other dot is just slightly lighter. But if it's too close, right, you, you've lost the advantage of making it pop. Now people have to look at it and think, like, oh, is that really blue? Is that really just a little bit lighter? So now you put that cognitive burden on your users, right? This is why, you know, looking for that Lego piece is well so hard, right? So many colors, it's all jumbled up. Um, but actually what happens is when your brain starts saying, I need that red piece, your brain will pay more attention to the red colors, right? So if people are used to that there's a certain color that's the one that they need to look for, their brains will automatically kind of detune the image, right? Like it, not to this extent, but, you know, the red pieces are now really easy to find, and our brains will actually actively start being more sensitive to certain colors if you're consciously, if I'm looking for a red piece, my eyes are going to be watching for a red piece. And then you do that little wear layer, right? It's like, is that the right piece? And now that you found red, now I'm building on, okay, is it, you know, is it a one by two? Is it a two by two? Is it the right piece? I'm doing that kind of pattern testing. So our eyes function with color on kind of three levels. One is red to green spectrum. The other one is the blue to yellow spectrum. And the last one is the white to black spectrum. And the, uh, the, end, the extreme ends of all those colors are the most contrasty, the most likely to pop, right? They're the most effective um, colors to use. What's an important thing to note, though, is that um, white and black are the most contrasted. So a big mistake people make a lot of the time is they, uh, you know, they'll have black text, and then they'll change one line of text to a different color to highlight it. But actually, if you've got black text on a white background, making that text red has actually has a lower contrast value than the black, right? So it's a weird mistake that doesn't make any sense when you, like, until you start thinking about it and understand how that contrast works. And I'll show you an example in a minute that makes a big difference. And you also have to think of that kind of luminance contrast, right? So obviously black on black is a bad idea. White on white is a bad idea. Um, and then in between, there's varying things, right? And this is all about our eyes making enough of a distinction between the shape of, like, between one shape over another shape, right? So if the white on white, is, if it's too close, right, if it's like kind of like light gray, it's still quite hard to read. You really have to look at it to make those distinctions. Whereas I'm sure, you know, you look at the, the white on black or the black on white, and you can instantly kind of pick out that letter. So as I was saying, you want to ensure the highest con contrast goes to emphasized elements. So if you look at this one, and now I'm going to switch it to this, can you see how the emphasized element now actually stands out more, right? By reducing the other text, uh, I can go back up for a second too, right? There, that, that white text at the top is actually still going to be the highest contrast in what pulls your eye. But as soon as you switch it, that's what pops. And you want to be careful about how you use the colors too, right? Because you don't want to paint yourself into a corner, literally, I think, where you know, you've used white text on everything and now you're trying to find a contrast element. Like even what I do when I do uh, presentations for work, the, the font color that I use in all my PowerPoint presentations is actually a dark gray. I actually take it down a few shades from solid black, so if I need to, I can actually make text a full black and bold, and it still really pops. But it's not, just, it's not like I've made these crazy decks that are all funky colors all the time just so I can have a black or white. You can use that kind of uh, the, uh, the brightness and the lightness to your advantage. So if you kind of knock your text down a few shades, it's still highly legible, but you'd leave yourself room to make more contrast. Second pop-up channel I want to talk about is shape. So we've got um, kind of three main ways that shape uh, can be effective, right? One is orientation. 
So, you know, if you've got a whole bunch of shapes and one's out of whack, you know, anyone, all the OCD folks will, you know, you, that one thing that's out of alignment you pick up right away. Um, we're really good at vertical and horizontal. We can tell if something is straight up and down and you can look at it and you know, hey, that's not quite level. Uh, same with horizontal. When it gets to the middle, we're actually really bad. We, it, it, we don't have a great appreciation. 45 is kind of better than nothing, but those areas in between, we're, we'd be generally hard pressed to look at a line that's not perfectly upright or perfectly uh, vertical uh, and tell you exactly what degree that is or even maybe accurately guess at what that degree is. Um, that's why pie charts suck as a chart, right? <laughs> pie charts are really bad because we're not good at estimating those lines. We can't really make a, a good quantified decision about you know, what's this width of the pie and translate that to the data. Um, obviously, if it's like a quarter, three quarters, things like that, but if you've got like a dozen data points and you've got all these fine little lines, it's actually really hard for us to interpret that and take it out. Uh, the other one I talked, oh sorry, I, I totally skipped over. Uh, size. So size really is obvious, right? The difference in size, we can, this, the whole shape thing kind of becomes a Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other, right? It's finding that way to make a difference. So the size, it's bigger than the other ones, it's smaller than the other ones. Uh, and lastly, it's distortion, or it's a different shape, right? So difference in the actual shape. Um, the more that we can um, make everything else uniform and make the one thing you need them to notice different, better. Uh, so proximity. So like I said, our brains like to bind and make con you know, contour and binding and make objects out of things. But what also happens is even though th those circles are completely isolated, your brain actually will kind of draw a circle around them, right? It will start, so that spatial relationship that objects have to each other will actually um, have a big impact or make a big difference as well. So your brain will naturally draw like lines, like you know, mental lines around things and group them together and recognize, hey, that thing's aside from everything else. Uh, this is pretty extreme, but even uh, more subtle ones can be effective. But so just keep that in mind, how you're actually positioning things will also convey relationship. Right? When you start laying content on a screen, um, the best example is how you, know, you look at a, a newspaper and there's like a picture, but then the headline for the next article underneath it is kind of big and bold and you know how they make inappropriate combinations sometimes. So that's your brain kind of saying, oh, that's a big picture and that's a big headline. And it kind of even ignores the subline caption text of the picture and puts them together. Right? Your brain is trying to make sense of this and, and bind it. So, be very clear about what you group together and how you relate it to everything else on an interface or on a page or a design or even in a space. Right? There's a, a great blog um, called uh, Architectures of Control and Design by a guy named Dan Lockton of the UK and he looks at how um, spaces can be designed to control behavior. Right? And so uh, this proximity thing comes up just even in how you design a space and how people move through you know, by giving certain visual cues people naturally will just convey, will take that, you know, the, the layout of the carpet on the floor. If it's all one color everywhere, but then there's a red wide berth between two doors, people will follow that red carpet, right? Their brains kind of make that combination and, and make that process. So this, this isn't all just screen, this is even in the real world, like how you actually interact with moving around uh, can be highly relevant. And last but not least, I've got uh, the pop channel of motion. Oh, we lost, uh, there we go. Uh, so motion, uh, you know, if that ball was bouncing back and forth and I was trying to sit here and talk to you, you'd probably keep looking up at that ball, right? So motion can be a highly effective way. That's why, uh, you know, the taskbar icons, you know, they pop, they change color, they blink. And when they're useful, it's great, but when they're not, it's driving you nuts because your taskbar is always lighting up and stealing your attention, right? Um, so it can be a very effective tool. Uh, this is the one I would say use very sparingly and wisely. Right, motion. Uh, let's not go back to the animated GIF days of late 90s internet or blinking text. Yeah, yeah. let's not reintroduce the blink tag. Thank you. Um, so, some advice. The best Ghostbusters uh, recommendation, right? Don't cross the streams. What you don't want to do is start trying to combine all those uh, um, features together. Right? Our brains can actually only process kind of one at a time. Uh, so you don't want to create what are called visual conjunctions. So if I ask you to look for a blue square, what you're actually going to find, if you try and look, 
you'll probably find that as you're looking at the screen, the squares are popping up more than, like, so at one point it'll be mostly squares, and then it'll be all the blue stuff, and then it'll be all the squares, and then it'll be all the blue stuff. Trying to actually look for a blue square in one step, you can't actually do it. You have to find something that's blue and confirm if it's a square, or move on. Or find something that's a square and confirm if it's blue. You can't actually just straight go to blue square. It's a weird concept, but if I left this up for a few minutes, you'll probably, are people seeing this when they try and look? The, the, the squares are popping more, or the colors popping more? Even though these are really con high contrast colors, right? It's not like I, I'm asking for orange or yellow, but even that high contrast, your brain kind of fights itself for what it wants to focus on. And of course, don't be subtle, right? Yeah, like we're talking about here, really, to make it, to speak to the brain and kind of get to it before the user even thinks about it, you want it to be very obvious. The brain has to find it, get it right away, get processed. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the strongest pop up effects are when there's a single, there's one that's very much the odd one out, right? That everything else is kind of uniform and there's one thing that's clearly, clearly different. That is the best uh, kind of way. And also avoid visual interference.